and, and I think that's a sea change where everyone, right, and, and if there are some accountants or finance people have to understand carbon accounting. Without that, you can't do business today, right? Uh, water accounting, water is a huge issue in the country, one would argue, and uh, you know, it's, it's hardly accounted uh, in, in any forum. How many, you know, businesses do look at water, the way they look at their P&L cash flows uh, is as important or maybe more, some would argue. Uh, you know, we, we're talking about circularity, I think some of the points that were made, how circular is a business? Uh, I mean, it's a reminder, a global circularity report says we use uh, only 8.9, 8, 8.5% of what we use in circular manner, otherwise everything is single use. And I think that's a sea shift that has to happen in terms of all the business decisions, Ashwini, that you talked about, that uh, it's not at the end of the day, and Martin, that you said reporting, because that's a byproduct. But it's all our decision making when Nitesh is taking a flight versus train versus walking. He needs to be knowing in this decision making because otherwise we are optimized for efficiency, which one would argue is not the best way this world would work, you know, because there is a need for resilience and other factors. Uh, so Ashwini, your, your views on, on this aspect uh, in terms of what are the challenges here? So uh, first let me, you know, open up. Uh, another aspect, you know, we're talking about environmental sustainability, and I think just to pick the example, what uh, you know, Satish was referring to his grandmother, the social sustainability and the environmental sustainability cannot be alienated from each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's something which is very important to be borne in mind. And when we are talking about uh, a country like India, and you're trying to push the agenda of environment protection, biodiversity, you have to also keep in mind that a whole range of community relationships also need to be managed at the same time. I mean, if, if a particular forest has been protected for several years, for generations, who has done that? Hmm. It's been done by those tribal communities around that. I mean, there is an example in Odisha where I think perhaps the only one in the country where a very, very large piece of forest is managed not by forest department, it's managed by the community itself. Right. And they've been doing it for the last six, seven, ten generations. Uh, so it's called community-based uh, community forestry management rather than, and government later on comes with the concept of joint forestry management, which is a sub-lower level of, you know, forestry management in that sense. So, so what I'm trying to uh, bring out as a point is the second challenge of doing sustainability work is that A, First myth that has to be broken is sustainability is not ma about making sustainable profits, mm. but it is about making profits sustainable. Right. So mm. that's number one. Number two, in order to en enlarge the agenda of profit, it's about people's profit, community's profit, environment's profit, not just the enterprise's profit. And therefore, the second agenda is not just about data, what, what comes to you. The, the second important aspect is what do you do with that data? Mm. Thankfully, today, uh, because of the number crunching, the amount of data that is being generated, technology is available. We have word processors and Excel sheets and all that thing. Lots of data is available. Unfortunately, data is segregated, it is siloed, <laughs> and it is not being read with a certain lens to bring it and right. turn it into information. Correct. So I think that is the biggest challenge, if you ask me, that data is available from a number of sources and how that data is supposed to be interpreted and turned into a decision-making tool, I think that's where the challenge is. And who's interpreting also. And who's interpreting it with what context and whether you are using it for your limited understanding or not, I think that's where, where a lot of work needs to be done. I'll, I'll just quote one example where we are trying in our small, humble way to you know, kind of do that. Looking at the nuances of climate action vis-a-vis -vis biodiversity, climate action is not just about planting trees. Yeah. You know, if you start planting non-indigenous varieties of trees, you're talking about a whole complex problem that you would create uh, in terms of biodiversity. And fortunate part is that many of these decisions, they will show their impacts 10 years, 15 years later. So, so one wrongdoing today is actually going to create an impact 15 years later when mm. perhaps nobody would be there available to measure it. So it's important to do right things in the right manner. And uh, realizing that this is a significant problem, uh, one initiative that we have recently taken, I think we just launched it um, uh, about 15, 20 days ago. <coughs> We're calling it is Earth Exponential. Mm. The idea being that A, collaboration is important, B, 
the subject is very vast and nuanced. So can we bring implementers, donors, and knowledge institutions under one platform? Mm. Because the decision making that has to be done, the data that is available by a whole range of organizations, uh, consulting firms to you know the international multilateral agencies, whole amount of data is available. But what do you do with that data? Who helps you navigate yourselves through that data maze? I think that's that's one one piece which is very important and which is where we thought that these kind of collaborative platforms would be very important. So I urge all of you to maybe check that website. It's called Earth Exponential. The idea being that how can we congregate, crystallize information at one place and create both offline and online opportunities for people to learn from each other and mm -hmm. then replicate those models. So this is one. The third problem is you and I are passionate about environment, but you cannot be doing at the cost of human uh, mm -hmm. development being stymied. So therefore, it's important to go and engage with the communities, which is again a big piece. Uh, and for that, a populous country like India has much bigger challenges than say, for example, vis-a-vis -vis Europe or US. So therefore, whatever we want to do in the environmental space, it would always have a social dimension to it and we need to work strategies around that. Unfortunately, for that, not much of data and study is still available. We have again, as I said, segregated data either through NSSO surveys or through NFHS surveys. So we, we try looking at an individual or a society from the lens of either health or labor and so on and so forth, not as a composite framework. Yeah. So that composite framework cannot be done compositely. It has to be you know, picked up from data points and then looked at from a local context. So this is the second problem that I thought would be important for us to you know, look at. Yeah. No, I think actually that's a great point uh, you know, to say that a lot of time we, how, how many times I would say we include communities and society as one of the key stakeholders, right, when we are looking at a lot of these strategies. And I think that's why this point on social is, is, is very critical because at the heart of it is human capital, human rights, society, and without humans, you really can't solve some of this problem because whatever you do, I think it'll impact the society at large. So taking people together is very important. And I, a lot of time, you know, people say that as we look at this word called ESG, uh, which was coined by UN, as, as all of you know, about 17 years ago. So uh, it's environmental, social, and governance. And many times people say that S and G are not silent, but it's very least understood, right? What S is, uh, right? Uh, human capital, human rights, society. And then one would also argue environmental and social are goals. Governance, how you get there. I think the tone at the top, I think, are so critical. And that's why this term that has been there for the last 17 years called ESG is kind of coming together. But I agree with you. A lot of organization, I'll be honest, when I look outside in, are focusing on e, uh, EHS, uh, but not the holistic aspect, and especially the, the human capital side of it, I think, which is very, very critical, both inside the organization and the ecosystem, uh, Satish, that you talked about, that organization is not only your own people, but the entire extended supply chain, the third supplier, the fourth supplier, which most of the time you won't even know, right, as we call from cradle to cradle or cradle to grave, right? It's a very, very complicated uh, uh, supply chain. So no, absolutely, Ashwini, thank you for highlighting but that. There, there's yeah. also, I, I found it quite strange, right? Most companies make products or services that will uh, make life a little bit, a bit better, better for people. Yeah. You know, more clean water, a more comfortable car, a safer car or whatever, right? And if that is the goal of a company, why wouldn't the practice be based on having as good a uh, so solution as possible for the people working there or in the supply chain? If the aim is to make the world better for people through products or services, yeah. the aim should also be to do it in such a way that it makes it better for people. Yeah. I'm Including that, all stakeholders. Right? Absolutely. I think, that's, yeah, I, I, so I, I think th that if, if I was to... Um, say, where does it start to become a sustainable company? It starts with the board. The board needs to be convinced, yeah. and they have to sit down the foot and say, we're going in this direction. Then it comes to the management that needs to be able to answer the questions that the board asks them. How are we doing this? What are we doing? And that's who drives then, of course, the whole chain of data uh, to be able to make, uh, what should we say, uh, fact-based decisions. Yeah, no, I think governance and tone at the top is very important. So maybe just, just following a little bit, Satish, in terms of as you look at the board, C-suite, yeah. how, how do you see, are, are, are board 
oriented to this while we all know the subject how do they integrate into their design thinking their strategy do's don'ts as they look at an mna uh, what consideration to think about i know it's a very complex uh, subject and a question but but how, how do they unpack this uh, at the board level yeah i if I, I, uh, sorry you just start uh, with that and yeah, I'll I'll know. Know. <laughs> i think first of all we need to understand that if you sit on a board you you're quite conscious not to be exposed not knowing anything so it's, it's, it's fairly hard to train boards in, in, in public, right? You have to do it a little bit more behind the line yeah. in, in, in sessions. That, that's a fact, right? Because you, you, you don't want to sit and say, I don't know anything about this, right? So you have to educate them and, and do it in a certain manner. We, we've chosen to use one another company that I've started and founded, My Sustain Online, to do it online so that they can do it themselves, right? In, in peace and quiet. But sorry. <laughs> Uh, absolutely well said. So first of all, uh, I think uh, we need to recognize the fact that board is also made up of human beings. Yes. <laughs> they are not Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwar. So uh, there are a lot of things they don't know, and I'm not here to reveal all the secrets <laughs> what happens in the boardroom. Not but yet. then, uh, uh, but then the point is absolutely right. The tone has to be set by the board, yeah. and the, there is an expectation that the board is expected to see beyond what a CEO or the management mm. sees. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you do this? Now, here is a simple uh, thing which I, I personally feel it is brought in by live examples. When you do X, you get Y as the return. Anybody can figure that out. But what needs to be done is when you do X, it will result to Y, which will result to Z. Mm. And that is what I call it as a cascading effect or a multiplier effect, or a snowball effect. And the board needs to understand that. Now, it may sound a bit complex, but let me simplify it. At the end of the day, you want a good return to the shareholder. Let's not beat around the bush on that. You need to be giving good returns to your stakeholders. Absolutely perfect. So how do you enable that, is what I call it as the cascading effect. Number one, every company can have access to technology. Every company can have access to capital. Simple. What is that one differentiator which differentiates A great companies from not so great company? Is the people, is the talent. And today the biggest challenge for the board or the CEO is how do you attract and retain the good mm. talent? And I think that's where you catch the nerve. Today's talent is no longer going to get impressed with your balance sheet, with your P&L, the example which I said that they are looking at the balance sheet of the planet and not your company. So you need to prove genuinely that you are a good corporate citizen and when you young millennials associate with this company, you are associating with a genuinely a good corporate citizen company. Mm -hmm. How do you do this? You need to be open about it saying that we are not 100% renewable now, yeah. but in 10 years we want to be that. And in every town hall, need to share that this is where we are, this is our dashboard. So be, be humble, be honest, be upfront. People would love it. Second, today in our times, when I would say that when I would go to a supermarket and pick up the product, what would I see? I would see the name of the brand and I would look at the MRP of the product. Guys, this is a fact. I'm just telling you exactly what. You may agree or you may disagree, but I'm sure there is, there is that DNA in all of us. Now when my daughter goes to the supermarket, the first thing she sees is she turns the back of the product and looks at the ingredients of the product. Are they natural? Yeah. Are they organic? Where is it sourced from? That's a reality. This is what a consumer survey has taught. So if you as a board, if you are only interested in the branding and the advertising and the P&L of your product, guys, you are missing the boat. The carpet may be pulled under your feet and you would not even know. So what do you need to do? You need to set up a a environment in a company which promotes the how part of the business. Are you sourcing from the right vendors? Are you using the right ingredients? Are you using a renewable ingredients? Because your consumer is looking at it. Second example. And the third, uh, I just wanted to give some, an example which all of us in India witnessed, which probably at that time it came as a surprise when our prime minister, on his first speech in the Red Fort, I'm not here to promote any political agenda, I'm just trying to give as a business example, the first issue he raised was about toilets and sanitation, Swachh Bharat, the Swachh Bharat. Yeah. People were aghast in that, what is he talking? 
that's a repercussion effect. What did he do smartly with that? He created employment in that sector. A clean country gets a good environment for prosperous business. Yeah. A clean country <coughs> creates healthy citizens. So he was looking at the repercussion effect of it, which today we are saying it is happening. Now, to what extent is happening? That's a different debate. But this multiplier effect is what I call is the role of the board to see that vision, set that vision. Probably it's difficult even for people to articulate, yeah. but get that straight so that eight, ten years down the line, people start seeing the results. That that's that's what I would say is probably the real visionary role of the board which needs to be played. Yeah. No, no, well said, absolutely. So Ashwini, uh, you know, I know JSW is a big conglomerate, so many companies. H how do you take everyone together? Uh, how does right from chairman to watchman understand this language, this vision, and, and carry them in a coordinated, synchronized manner? H how does one achieve it? Uh, I don't say that we've still achieved it. Hmm. But this is always work in progress. But just to pick up, you know, from what Martin and uh, you were saying, Mr. Rao. I think we also need to realize that boards, companies are a subset of the entire society. So you touched upon the human capital aspect. There is a whole range of social capital aspect also, you know, which kind of plays a significant role. Uh, as an enterprise, you have a role in the society. You, you are being looked at as a champion, not just from the economics point of view, but also uh, from the social and the environmental mm. piece of it. because. Uh, the, the imperative for businesses to get into this, you already talked about it, is going to only enhance because the social contract is shifting towards private sector. So, so the boards would either learn it on their own or they would be compelled to learn because the social contract is shifting. Mm. The expectations are not just from the government today. They are now from the corporates as well. And when you're talking about African countries, yeah. there are… And from the employees, like you said. Right? Of course. You can't attract course. talent. Today. Yeah. yeah. So when you're talking about economies, there are, there, are, there are corporations which are bigger than some of the national economies, right? So, so the size of the, 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 the influence of the corporates is going to go up. Thankfully, what happens is, and uh, I mean, in, in terms of JSW as a group, uh, you know, with so many companies all put together, I think what actually works very well is that a, we've, we've tried doing things which we can do internally, first of all. Mm. So like we talk about, you know, walk the talk. I think that's one part which always has been kept there. Uh, plastics, for example. <clears throat> so we, you are welcome to our office, but you'll not get any plastic bottles, uh, reusable water jars. We don't use plastic. Our own steel coated, you know, sheets, which used to have plastic layer on it for mm. protection, we don't use it anymore. Mm. You know, sort of a whole lot of examples. Uh, steel plants are uh, zero liquid discharge. Mm. The circularity aspect, flue glasses are used for running turbines by which energy is produced. That energy is again used for yeah. producing steel. Slag is used for making the country's first slag-based cement. You know, so a whole lot of examples within the group, within the companies and intercompany exchanges, you know, which, which creates those opportunities of learning from each other and yeah. taking advantage of it. I think that's, that's one part. The second part is that since we are at so many locations, we understand and we get exposed to a whole range of environmental and social issues mm -hmm. across, say, 14 states of this country mm -hmm. and, and some very remote locations. By default, you know, when you're a steel producing company, you are at some of the most remote parts, you know, close to the mining areas, close to the tribal communities. So, so you do get exposed to a whole range of information which is there at your disposal. And I think that exposes you to the kind of best practices that need to come out. I think this diversity that we enjoy as a group, hmm. uh, both in terms of geographical diversity uh, and also as, as, I would say, sectoral diversity, that enriches our learnings hmm. internally, I think. And that's, that's the way I put it. And which then helps us to keep on evolving what we try doing, you know, as a responsible corporate citizen to ensure that while the larger, bigger piece picture on things like climate change, biodiversity, skill development, etc., is all kept in loop. But you know very well that for each set of stakeholders that you have, they have some very specific, unique requirements. And no one particular location's requirements are lesser in terms of, you know, importance than the other ones. And that's the kind of a balancing act, yeah. you know, which, which, which I think I, we, we all do together. 
and uh, and i think the entrepreneurial zeal which persists the the commitment towards nation building which persists goads everyone including me to you know work towards what we say mm. what we what we practice and what we envision into one continuum mm. so uh, the purpose with which the purpose. we organize i mean yeah. the first carbon credit jsw as a group got was somewhere in 2007 or 2006 mm. uh, people never used to talk about carbon credits at that point yeah. of time so 2006 or 2007 when the first carbon credits were achieved by the group they were utilized to set up the earth care awards mm. in 2008 this is the 11th edition of earth care awards and the idea was to you know i'm just giving this example yeah. sorry uh, just to not talk about what we are doing but to basically go around recognize what the work is being done by other organizations mm. Mm. right from individuals to communities to ngos to big corporates to go understand from their work recognize them and bring them up as champions from which other people can learn yeah so what i'm trying to say is you know the more you are into this habit of learning from others as you as, as we all agree being humble about what we are doing and being sensitive to a whole range of issues that are around you yeah. we can't solve all of them yeah but we at least can create opportunities to learn for ourselves and also maybe in a very humble manner also showcase what we have done what little we have achieved and if that can create an opportunity for others to learn from yeah i think that's that's what keeps us going uh, right here in maharashtra i remember when we began water being a very important subject for us uh, uh, i always give this example we were you know being looked at as okay we should be doing a lot of desilting of dams and all that i said no the data that we have is from 2008 and if in 2018 i'm trying to develop a program for desiltation mm. on a data which is 10 years old mm. then i'm not doing the right task mm. so let me first get the right scientific scientifically based data for right. myself and can i then showcase it out show, you know share that data with others so proper gis mapping looking at you know where the rich to valley concept works where water retention has to be done where water discharge has to be taken care of desilting is required where what what check dams need to be created what kind of slope corrections need to be done where soil conservation has to be taken care of you know whole science behind it let's create a repository of all that and then share it with the government so that's exactly what we did rather than just doing small little work here and there we we, we took up one region developed the whole report around that yeah. said very clearly that with our folded hands we can only handle this portion of this work it's it's mammoth right we can't do great that. way of storytelling right that's the data that's doing but the, this data the, is there this blueprint is there you as the custodians of this entire natural resource please please make use of it and make all of us like us to kind of contribute to this larger picture yeah, yeah. and Correct. that's what is going to create a ripple effect that's what what is going to create you know a you know sustainable change if i may use the word and i think that's that's where we kind of begin and stop hmm. doing things that we can do possibly within our means collaborating with people's outside yeah. creating opportunities for people to collaborate and then go back to the policy makers to yeah. see how they can contribute it's a great leadership playbook right because that's what world needs today right all the things that you kind of talked about uh, so coming to the last section pivoting to data i think lots been said what you can't measure you can't improve we need a single version of truth we need traceability there is a risk of greenwashing you need real time monitoring because at the end of the day if the data comes later then you can't embed into the decision making so so how can uh, this and obviously india is at the heart of the digitalization revolution that we are doing uh, how can digital data help accelerate this journey uh, uh, you know in terms of where we are and what are the enablers so maybe satish starting with you uh, if you want to take It that or all uh, right uh, martin uh, <laughs> starting with you how, how can data really accelerate this transition yeah it's it's a, it's quite simple it's a, the same with all data if it's sustainability data or productivity data right w- when you know when you can identify a problem hmm. then then you know at least where to start right and so data will actually highlight or pinpoint what are the key areas for you to first address in your operation where do you find the largest buckets of carbon dioxide for example uh, in and that is 
well-established knowledge now, right? We, okay, it can differ a bit between a cement company here or a cement company in, in Germany, but we know for a cement company where does it sit roughly yeah. in, in terms. Then we can go in and analyze the data. The hotspots at least are aware. In, yeah. The hotspots yeah. and, and, and make what you could say a global comparison, right? What is best practice? How are we comparing towards mm -hmm. that? So at least you know, is this a 200 meter race or is it a yeah. marathon, right? Where, are the, 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 where am I going with this? So data dr helps drive, I would say it saves time, mm -hmm. a lot of time. And it also allows you to rate um, remediation activities from difficult to easy, requiring capex, yes or no, mm -hmm. and what is the impact? How, what would happen if I switch these processes from using uh, coal to uh, solar? Well, I might say 6.8%. You can be that exact, actually. What are the effects on my SDGs, the Global Development Goals, um, or Strategic Development Goals? Uh, what is the effect on my carbon accounting? Uh, so so you, it, data helps speed up and, yeah. and make it more exact. But Martin, if someone and would it ask, also takes yeah. away, uh, I would also say, because we still have some climate denial uh, people around the world, yeah. right? Yeah. When you have the data, it's very difficult to argue against them. That is one of the most important factors that we've been driving, you know, why do we publish all these data globally on, on climate change, right? Because it's also, to be honest with you, it makes our kids a bit nervous, right? Yeah. That we haven't fixed it. Um, but we do that because data helps drive, uh, should we say, a change in mentality on a global scale as well. Yeah. But Martin, someone would argue, I mean, uh, these financial systems taken yeah. us 40, 50 years to stabilize, to yeah. get a PNL which is automated. Uh, and, and every organization we all know has many systems, right? From buy, make, move, sell, you have a supply relationship system, hundreds of portals in supplier itself, you have ERP which are complicated, multiple portals attached to it, transport management system is separate, you know, travel system is separate. Uh, you know, one would argue HR systems are broken, LMS is somewhere else, human capital is somewhere else. How do you really refresh all the entire digital strategy of an organization? Because sustainability is everywhere, right? So yeah. isn't that easier said than done because no one system would capture it? No. It's across the ecosystem. Y y yes, you, you basically need conversions, right, of data into... Every, and all system to be upgraded. And you need APIs if you want to do it on a regular basis. But not all data needs to be captured on a daily basis. Hmm. If you, for example, identify uh, your products, how it's split by suppliers, what plastic are we using from each one, where does it come from, right? You get a picture and you say, okay, by switching these suppliers, buying this material here, who, who has a very uh, you look at say, the big picture, many, many distributions per, per year, right? <coughs> maybe 600 times twice yeah. a day, switching that to a different location, I can save on the transport, right? Yeah. Uh, Okay, that data might be downloaded once a year, but it still gives you a picture that allows you to make that change. Of course, the, over time, all ERPs will be integrated and converted into yeah. carbon data. It, it's a must, right? right. Because I, I also want to touch on you, what you have to understand is that it's global changes on regulation that is driving uh, how India will have to change. We just we're, have now been introduced in Europe, uh, CBAM, carbon border adjustment mechanism, meaning that if you produce something outside Europe, you will have to pay a tax on the carbon used for producing that product, entering Europe for every shipment. It starts with steel and, and aluminum and, and cement and such, but it will be spread to all products. You have the uh, um, Deforestation Act, which says that you have to prove now, whatever you ship to Europe, that it doesn't come from land that was deforestated in 2020 or later. That's just another one. You have the extended <coughs> producer responsibility, uh, and which means that you as a producer are in, responsible for end of life of your product after the consumer or, or have used it. And all these costs, uh, uh, of course, all, uh, all these regulations will affect India as well. Yeah. It's just a matter of time. And it already has. Your BRSR yeah. is being upgraded now for next year, where you have to actually prove assurance of uh, compliance. The assurance bit now becomes very important. But right? how did you get the data? It can't be, we, we had three guys in a room and they put it down on an Excel sheet. It's not going to be good enough. Yeah. 
I know our, our data is showing we are getting out of time and maybe yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, unsustainable territory. But maybe Satish Ashwini, just last words from you before we open to uh, the folks to have any questions I on just, this subject. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to add one thing yeah. on this uh, topic, as Martin rightly said, is data is important. But let's not lose sight of the fact that why do we need data? Because data by itself, it yeah. can completely confuse you. I mean, tons of spreadsheet is not mm -hmm. going to take you anywhere. Don't lose sight of the end result which that data is going to deliver. Take simple, small steps is what probably I would share with friends uh, here. There cannot be every, any meeting where you don't touch upon whether it's a people review, whether it's a business review, whether it's an operations review, or whether it's a financial review. Do not end the meeting without asking this question on how are we doing on our ESG goals? How are we doing on the Simple question. People will figure it out, how to do it. It could be measured in a back of the envelope calculation yeah. or it could be an SAP. That's yeah. okay. But set the tone that this is damn important. I know a company where no presentation in the factory can start without the first slide being your safety, safety yeah. slide. Period. It's a that's, culture. It's a culture. That's a culture. Yeah. So don't lose sight of the results which data is going to deliver. I think that's a point I would like to make strong, even though it means a small humble step. That's okay. No, good point. Ashwini, last word, any bit. We're already 19, 20 seconds ahead of our schedule. Yeah. <laughs> so let's respect the data. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we'll open it up for, uh, I know, uh, uh, you know, a lot of points and I know we can keep talking for many hours and still not be able to cover the depth and breadth of this subject and the complexity uh, that it ingrains and so many topics which are at the heart of it that we touched briefly on. But uh, we'll open it up. Uh, if there are any mics around, people can uh, questions, comments, input, suggestions. Uh, I think there's one uh, gentleman here. Uh, if you can pass the mic, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, please. Hi, uh, thank you for your time and discussion. I must say, while I enjoy working with Martin, it was a pleasure to hear other gentlemen here. Um, I have a question for you, Ashwin, in particular. I started off my career at Musco, so steel making. Uh, goes back <laughs> in my roots. Um, and you know, steel manufacturing for that matter is a dirty business, right? Uh, it, is, it involves a lot of informal labor as well, right? And we sp I like the fact that for the first time, there was a top management that was actually talking about social and governance. Governance, of course, there is no escape for you guys because you are the top management, but about the social was a pleasure to hear. Now, I want to understand how many times does board or in your war rooms, do you really speak and discuss components of social? I think somehow we lean towards only human rights. Uh, we lean towards employee health and safety, which are very critical to our operations. But let's say in our informal sector, improving their lifestyle or their uh, capacity to earn, does business really care to take targets like that where they work they, with their contractors, not just to have a tick in the box with provident fund and health and facility, but, but like how, how far have we moved the needle when it comes to their well-being in their capacity to earn? Just, just because I find it a little disturbing being a social auditor myself. Um, and yeah, I would really love to hear your thoughts on that one. It's a, it's a great question. And gives me the opportunity to you know shed some more light on the way we operate uh, you're right i mean uh, when it comes to ehs it's whole discussion just about the employees direct employees of the company but thankfully you also have a csr committee uh, where where very specific discussions are done over and above and beyond the 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 the, the workforce which is directly related with the company so, so when I am talking about, I am not talking about uh, the group in terms of its employee practices. I am talking more about what we do as stakeholder practices. Just to give you an example, and so of course, number one, it is discussed. We try seeing what more can be done, uh, especially the 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 uh, you know people who are attached indirectly to the businesses. Uh, not necessarily falling under the category of employees, but still need to be cared for. So I'll give you one small little example, which I think will give you a glimpse of how we operate. Uh, somewhere in 2016, if I'm remembering, the number of truckers directly or indirectly involved with the, the, the group establishments 
uh, in one particular location was about 10,000. And they, they are not nowhere directly related to us. And typically, you know, I mean, in the development space, if you will talk about truckers, the first thing that comes to people's mind is, oh, HIV AIDS awareness, as if they are the only ones who spread <laughs> HIV AIDS in this world. So the program, of course, began with looking at how HIV AIDS awareness can be done around truckers. <coughs> Over the years, today, the program <coughs> caters to almost 10 lakh truckers, not just the truckers in terms of HIV AIDS awareness, that's past, that's, that's not, not even being thought of. Today we talk about a comprehensive health awareness for them comprehensive health packages for those truckers, uh, making sure that their family members are also taken care of. So, so connecting them with the right kind of opportunities through which the children can avail scholarships from the government or from us. Uh, looking at what kind of facilities can be created for those truckers across various truck terminals across the country so that those truckers get the right kind of food, basic sanitation, stay facilities, etc. And uh, you'll, be, you'll be amazed to know that these one million truckers and their family members, especially the children, and I would say even that in that, especially the girl child, is being, is being looked at how we can support them. So there's a whole program. Uh, we call it program uh, Hak Darsh uh, Mark Darshak. It's, it's with the startup called Hak Darshak. In last five years, this program, and it's not just for truckers, but for uh, other communities as well, with the support of some few crores by us, has been able to unlock support from the government itself to the tune of about 340, 350 odd crores, sorry, 450 odd crores. So that's, that's the opportunity of how you can take an initiative, connect people, and think beyond obvious things that you need to do as business. So truckers are not just, you know, for HIV AIDS awareness. They are about holistic health packages yeah. for them, road safety for them, thinking about their family members and making sure that that is also being taken care of. This is just one example that I tried to give you. Maybe I can share a lot more yeah. just offline. To, just to <laughs> point, just wanted to add one thing, uh, uh, going on the same thing. We all know that diversity adds efficiency and increases the productivity at workforce. Yeah. I mean, here is an actual example how in one of the earlier uh, organizations where I was working, we dribbled into it. I remember a conclave like this, which was all about diversity, and the topic there discussed was about the transgenders. And we all know that very little proportion of that community are really skilled. So that was like a chicken and egg. Yeah, we may want to employ them, but where do we do it? How do we do it? Because we know most of them end up either in begging or prostitution, but that's, that's, that's very unfair. So what we as corporate citizens can do? And guess what, what we ended up doing? He said, the, the question was, why can't we hire them in housekeeping or security? Because their, their value systems are amazing in terms of dedication. So it was more easy to employ them through a third party contract. It was a different issue that sometimes it's more difficult to employ in your own organization. But the issue is, the beauty of this is that sensitizes the entire organization yeah. and ecosystem on how to be inclusive in a true sense of diversity. And that created wonders that you, you are empathetic to people who are not your kind, but at the same time you are treating them as equals and you are a good corporate citizen. But that came through the third party contractors, if I may say, which is the secondary or the tertiary thing, but it delivered the results. No, thank yeah. you so much for sharing because now these are the best practices that actually make sense to a lot of people and company representatives here. So thank but, you so yeah, much. Absolutely. And thank you for raising that point. I think it's a very, very important. A lot needs to be done, uh, I think, on, on that domain. Any other questions or uh, perspective? Yes, yes. Uh, Ma'am here. If you can give the mic, please. <coughs> Hi, can I ask? Yeah, yeah, please, please, go ahead. As uh, Satish, uh, he mentioned about uh, using the Grandma Nuska uh, for the daily run, I have one question to all the uh, corporate champions. How many organizations, 
omni corporate houses use the recycled material be it for the fmcg uh, product or non fmcg as uh, ashwini also mentioned that uh, the usage of plastic is no longer being used and uh, if we are using recycled material how many organization are accounting it under the social responsibility account but this is very important because every house is using a chai patti or a sugar or anything you you every house is consuming but are we as a individual when we go to a shopping mall or we go to a kirana store do we check that what is the packaging material used the day when each one of us say that no we are not going to buy this product because it is not a recycled material that is where the individual responsibility will come in place my question what i'm trying to ask here and also will you be ready to pay more because yes, someone has yes. to pay yes yes yeah. sorry so i please yes. yeah. so my my point is how are organization accounting this as a primary imperative or as a primary goal because if every organization is going to take a oath for this i think we will solve it uh, at a basic ground root at a societal uh, level so uh, question to the forum to the experts so I'll, i'll just add and then i'll hand it to my panelists so i think this is a question i think martin alluded to in brsr what percentage of your input raw material is recycled or recyclable the two are very different the data is already out for 1000 companies so that data for first time there is transparency yeah. among india inc right and the data is not that great whether the data is accurate complete green washing that i will leave it separate but assurance coming there right because you can't really now do but the data is not that great you right the i think the the holy grail question is when people work in new product development that can you do it at speed and scale and with the costing right because the the reality of the day is that our consumer is nitesh ready to pay more for a shampoo which is of a different product and i will be honest i don't know uh, my daughter may i may not right my uh, you know my help certainly doesn't want to right she wants a 1 rupee sachet for her 20 paisa increase is a huge escalation so i think it's a complicated subject but i'll let uh, others kind of weigh in uh, sure i'm i'm happy to because i spent almost 20 years in the consumer product industry i'm i'm uh, happy to say if this question would have come to me 10 years back my blunt answer would be no yeah. we don't do it let's get that okay we were not doing it because we are all about how how Cost glamorous efficient. the packaging yeah. should look the product manager is always tasked saying that you need to ensure that this product launch is successful it delivers this volumes and it delivers this ebita period but i want to demystify one myth it's not all about adding cost when you go the sustainability route i remember an incident 12 years back when i was working in us i said for a food company and i remember we were making the presentation to one of the biggest retail chain called costco and as you know costco is, is big i mean they, they they turn volumes of products like this and when we went there to them with the food products the first question they asked is we don't want to know about your product we don't want to know about your price we don't want to know about your uh, the, how the product tastes the question asked was how are you doing your secondary packaging and tertiary packaging yeah. wow i mean that's completely out blue as of because that's the last thing we would prepare for a <laughs> presentation to the vice president of the costco but then that's where was the aha moment He said you know what that's the first thing we rip apart and throw it and that's a loss to you that's a loss to me cut it out come back to us with a presentation of a new product when you tell us that you have hardly any secondary packaging and the, when we say secondary packaging what and that saves cost uh, right it's that's, the yeah. it's the outer packaging which six of the cans can keep it but look at a big message it's a different story then they say whatever you save the cost give me 75% of it <laughs> that's a different one but the issue is that they brought in so your customer is forcing you to yeah. go the sustainability yeah. route and you are talking exactly on when your consumer pushes saying that i'm not going to buy this because this plastic cannot be recycled i'm not going to touch it when 10 of those consumers out of 20 start telling that fmcg companies have no choice nice. but to change yeah. so it's almost like a movement it's it's very unfair to say to in all honesty that a fmcg company or a, a b2b company do it it can't be done in isolation yeah. the whole ecosystem has to change 
and it will happen the way the forums like this today we are discussing imagine a forum like this 20 years back impossible but this is what is happening but when it is happening nobody has a crystal ball <coughs> but it's going that direction but for sure you're right i think importantly we are all employees consumers investors so i think we can drive a lot of awareness and change uh, but it has to be at speed and scale yes yes please gentlemen there so we have uh, highlighted one challenge which is see now the forum is uh, the forum is uh, you know aware of uh, benefits of esg and also i would say uh, basically uh, parameterizing a lot of these the frameworks so identification of metrics and what to do with data is key right but i think we are looking at it more at a horizontal level you know which then become the challenge of how does it impact the pnl of the company and why will a board take it up but what if we look at it in a vertical sense for example let's say company make some gains in diversity hiring you know it's part of esg framework and then we earn some credits you know we were talking about carbon credits like then it becomes tradable do you think that approach works because these are the low hanging fruits for each company where we say that you make some gains and move towards the overall let's say uh, uh, your sdg goal but in the interim also get some benefits you know you can actually use that to maybe some advantage on that you know this uh, kind of a market so we need both carrots and stick you are saying give more carrots to start with so i don't know who's going to give carrots and uh, where will they be sustained from and this is the last question sorry ladies and gentlemen we'll conclude after this yeah i just think that you you have to be aware that india is preparing for a carbon uh, accounting mechanism with basically spells tax or a price on carbon yeah. right Uh, common trade. With CBAM, we have to. There's no other. CBAM is Europe, and <laughs> India on itself will also have. Europe has pushed us. We didn't want yeah. it. Yeah. So anybody who will be taking actions reducing carbon basically saves money, and that of course becomes a market opportunity, and in, that will incentivize uh, in India probably a hundred thousand companies to work towards this sector of how how to achieve this uh, more efficiently. Uh, so I, I think that mechanism is being introduced here already, probably in the next two three years. I would say you will have it, uh, and it's about being prepared for that. Yeah. So I will take the last yeah. last question. Yes, please. If you can give us the mic, please. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, you know, when we want to solve a problem, they say you have to go to the root cause. Right? And while we talk about balance sheets and we talk about you know carrot and stick. I think the fundamental is what Ashwini mentioned about that it is your values that yeah, create yeah. Value, value, right? Yeah. So your valuation will come from your values ultimately. How much of the time, and perhaps based on your uh, program that you have for directors, if you could say, how much of training or time goes into really brainstorming on what is our value systems? Because they can be very different and can be very con contextual and divisive as well, right? As we all know. So what is that value systems and how much of time do we spend on the purpose that we really are there for? I mean, would love to hear that. Thank you. And I do think that's the root cause. Yeah, I, I know it's at the heart of it. It's the holy grail values and beliefs. Uh, difficult to measure all of these things and quantify, but I let some of my panelists weigh in. Uh, but but i absolutely at the heart of it that's 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 what the debate is all about we, thank you uh, we as a group uh, had a set of five values uh, i can just tell you that entire uh, set of top leadership devoted almost like a week broken up into two or three cohorts if i remember correctly to delve debate discuss and freeze on the values and not just that after that going into a cascading and disseminating process as well mm. has to so that so that the values flow. that have been agreed upon by all group jmds and me as a foundation ceo it's my responsibility to then cascade those values and practice them i think that's most important to practice them and demonstrate them in an active mode to my team members and it's the same expectation from the other group companies and uh, what i can tell you uh, is that i can see on the intranet uh, of the, the group that that initiative is being taken up by every single group company yeah. by every location 
because I think that that binds consistency us, and that yeah, binds us yeah. together as a team. If we want to achieve what we have decided to achieve, we would not be able to do that if we if we are not working as one cohesive team. So I think that's that's one example that I can give from our side. Okay, I, I think we are over time, kept you away from tea and coffee for 15 minutes, but thank you, thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed the discussion and some of the nuggets that uh, my panelists had uh, given, but thank you, thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank a huge you. round of thanks. applause, please. I would request the panel members and the moderators to please stay back. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for this engaging yet an insightful discussion. A huge round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> would uh, request you all to please stay back. Uh, so please stay back on stage. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm now going to request Mr. Ankit Bansal, founder and CEO of Safari Human Solutions, to please join us on the stage and present the token of appreciation to our panel members and to our moderator, please. I'm sure one of these best practices shared are eventually going to become the North Star for your respective organizations. And I'm sure you all have a lot of questions. So during the tea break, you may definitely reach out to our panel members, our moderator. Finally, to the one who moderated the session so beautifully well. For a group picture, requesting the panel members to please come ahead. As they conclude, ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for them, please.